Welcome to History at High Noon. I'm Carol Morgan. Glad to have everybody here. Um, have a few announcements before we get started. The first one is the Community Health and Wellness Day is having a walkathon. Is that correct? Uh, on Friday. Did I do that right? No, it's Saturday. Saturday, October the 6th, from 8 to 12. And they would love to have you come and walk, or you can even run if you get frisky enough. Uh, but if you also want to, we ha are having a cemetery event this week coming next weekend. On October the 5th at 6 p.m. with the reception following at 7 at the museum. And Saturday morning at 10 a.m., we're having our walk through the neighborhood at Douglas City Cemetery. And it is... Um, a look at some of the people from our past. It's fun. It is not uh, a lot of data and dates and numbers. It's just fun getting to know the people that live there. Okay? <clears throat> tickets are $10 a piece, and I have tickets. They'll be at the museum, or you can call me and say, reserve me two tickets, and I'll be glad to do that. And somebody will take, have them at the gate for you, and they'll have your name. So if you're interested in coming to our cemetery event, I'm talk it's a lot of fun. We all, somebody's always laughing. So that's what it is, and we'll be glad to have you if you'd like. We even have golf carts and some walkers there in case you want to roll and walk and sit down too. So we'll have it ready for you. Well, today we were supposed to have someone, and they canceled. We started our little journey on communities, and we will continue it next month. But this month, you get me. So sorry about that. <laughs> and I have notes because I am bad about names and numbers. But Bill's here today, Mr. Bill Ward, and he can help me remember. Um, 2012, my sister, who you all know, had this wonderful idea that someone needed to do a history of the community of West Green. So she hooked Sherry Jenkins and I up and said, y'all do the interviews and I'll handle the rest. Well, after two years of interviews and Sherry and I doing the rest, Joanne did edit the book. Um, we published an oral history of West Green. And the reason it's oral is there were no newspapers. There's no documentation except for local newspapers. And those were from Douglas or Bronxton. And they would have uh, Mamie and Joe Ray ate supper at Ms. McGowan's home on Friday evening. Well, where it's interesting, it's not history. So you had to hunt and pick and hunt and pick, and I've looked at more military records and census and county records than I ever wanted to in my life. But uh, we put together a little history of West Green. In the beginning, most of the people that first got there came over Burkitt's Ferry that crossed the river up at Hazel, between, uh, Hazel at Hazelhurst. What's Oak Muggy? Is that right? They came this way. Some of them came on foot, and some of them came with Indian land grants. The first document we can find was in 1850, there were 40 families in West Green. Two of those heads of families were women. Both of them had children, and one, uh, the Nettles woman, she later moved to Broxton, her husband was 51 years older than she was. Yeah, right. Uh, talk about robbing the cradle. Uh, but both of those women later married and moved, and both of them went to the Broxton area. Um, also, in 1870, there were 12 people in Coffee County, in, in West Green, excuse me, that owned over 2,000 acres of land. One of them was a black family, a Newton family. And their descendants lived there even when I was growing up. So, and then now they're in Douglas. But there was a, a very eclectic gathering of people. You had Indians, you had black folks, you had white folks, you had everybody there in West Green. And most of it settled first around where Burkett Baptist Church is and up. 
Matter of fact, the first church and school was at Friendship School in West Green in 1870, and it was Friendship Baptist Church. Friendship Baptist Church, people started moving more and more towards the sawmill, and I'll get to that in a minute. But the Baptist Church split. You had one church formed at Garrett, Georgia, which was West Grain, and another one that went to Burkett Baptist Church. So friendship was in that area, but it moved to what is today present day West Green. <clears throat> Wash Lot is a character from West Green history. There's no other way to put it. And almost every community has one. But the story says that Wash went to Texas with a buddy. Some say he was run out of Coffee County. But uh, he came back with a saddle bag full of gold. Now, these, remember, this is an oral history. There's no documentation for any of this stuff. But Wash was very instrumental in getting the Boyd, I'm going to look this, make sure I read this right, the Bird, Boyd Bird Cross Tie Company and Garrett Lumber Company into West Green. Those were the first two businesses. Before that, it was just where a tram from Hazelhurst stopped called the 20. And the only thing at that location where the tram stopped was a black woman named Mammy. And she sold anything a man on the railroad wanted. Is that PC enough? <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's just the gossip. But I tell you what, I've got enough, enough writings and stories. I could write another book, but I have to wait for a lot of people to die before I publish that one. <laughs> <laughs> the GNF, at that time, washed on 11,000 acres. And this was in 1897. That's a lot of land in West Green in 1897. The Georgia-Florida Railroad built a branch to West Green and Broxton. Wash built a new depot and he built setting houses for the railroad workers or people that were going to come to West Green. This was in the late 1890s. Um, he and his son Warren also divided up West Green into what is maps. At this time it's called Garrett, but I, Garrett doesn't come easy to my lips. But um, they divided up the streets and they were selling lots. They were urging people to come to West Green. The big move came, or growth, the biggest growth spurt came, not with just turpentine and sawmills and that kind of stuff, but when the South Georgia Farm Company bought 7,000 acres of wash lots land. These people hired folks to run their business and to get people from North and South Carolina and Tennessee to West Green. That's how they came. You got land, it's, it's cheap, it's free, it's whatever, and they would come. And a lot of them were in the turpentine and sawmill business, but a lot of them opened stores up. Um, the first store built just to be a store was by J.J. Ward in 1906. Now, there were other little places where you could buy stuff, but they weren't a mercantile store where you could buy everything. And that's what J.J. Ward did. He also built the two-story hotel that was in West Green that when I was a little girl, we would dare each other to go through because there was ghosts in there. <laughs> um, Wash gave land for school in West Green at Garrett in 1912. But uh, in 1914, in 1913, excuse me, South Georgia Farm Company sent Mr. Westbrook Brook, and Mr. Green to be their promoters. Mr. Crow Marty from Hazelhurst wasn't doing that good a job because it seemed like his son-in-law that lived in West Green was getting more than he needed. So uh, they sent Mr. Westbrook and Mr. Green, and they became promoters. And in 1914, West Green became West Green, and it was incorporated as a city in the state of Georgia. Now, to retain that city charter, you had to have city elections. Well, the people at Garrett Lumber Company got tired every Monday morning 
of having to get all their workers out of jail for drunk, disorderly, firing weapons, you know, all just like a western town back in the old days. And they didn't want the sheriff there. They, West Green had a sheriff. So they never had a city election because the lumber company didn't want it. So years later, really pretty recently, they disincorporated all those little cities in, West, in the state of Georgia that had not ever had a city election. So West Green lost their city charter, whatever. But we always had unofficial mayors, whether you liked it or not. Um, a lot of people in 1914, the state of Georgia cracked down on people having to pay property tax. Now you think that's funny now, but before then, if you bought, if you could, you did, and if you didn't, it's all right, we'll just float along. So the value of land went from one to three dollars an acre, and all of a sudden it's five dollars an acre, and you had to pay in cash. One thing folks didn't have in the early 19th, 20th century was cash money. <clears throat> Wash Lot borrowed money from the Pennsylvania Mutual Life Insurance Company. He wasn't the only one. He was the major one. And in 2011, at the Coffee County Courthouse, there are still liens on property in West Green where Pennsylvania Mutual Insurance Company is owed, but it no longer exists. So that is still there on those records, lots of them. I didn't believe Daddy, I had to go look. Um, they had a local phone exchange in 1912, but it was just in and around downtown West Green. In 1938, Joe Ray, Otis Wilcox, Lyman Hayes, George Phillips, and L.F. Kirkland, who had married Mr. McCromarty's daughter, uh, built a West Green exchange that went to Douglas and connected. But also, in 1938, there were seven general stores, a hotel, a meat market, a grist mill, a post office, two drug stores, Schreiber's Bootery and Merchandise, Dr. Hall, a bar right by the depot, a voting place, a blacksmith, two garages, a barber shop, an ice and fish house, the Masons and the Knights of Pythias. This is in 1938. So for that time, West Green was a pretty good and big active thing. And you ask, well, what happened? The sawmill closed and it moved. So did the jobs, so did a lot of the people, which happened to a lot of little communities in this area. Um, a little bit about the churches. I told you about friendship. Lone Hills having their homecoming. The, the, it was formed in 1865 as a church. They were meeting there before then, but it did not form as a church until 1865. West Green Methodist Church was built in 1915. Midway Methodist Church that was on the old Mark Mobley Road out of West Green uh, was 1857. Uh, some folks from Tanner Town, Taylor Town, Taylor Town, came in. They were kin to the Burkitts. When Ms. Burkett was a tailor from that area, and her her brother came and started a Methodist church there. In the 1920s, there were schools, but in 19, let me get this up because I don't want to. There was no black schools in West Green until 1938. And the black school was built where the Baptist Parsonage is now. Uh, when I was a little girl, um, Azaline lived there. That was the first black school. And Granddaddy built it in 1938, and the first teacher was Fanny Newton. And her brother Randall taught there also. Now, what everybody remembers about Randall was he had an immense library. These, the Chet Newton children had gone to school in North Carolina on the reservation. And he had amassed lots of books. And, and Daddy would say, said he'd, you could go get one and borrow one and bring it back. He never charged anybody. He just let them come get it. 
Turpentine was still big up until the 50s, but the largest three turpentine people in West Green, even after the sawmill closed, was W.R. Pilkington and his son Emmett, uh, Moses Dump Kirkland. I don't even want to know why they called him Dump. Somebody said he was short, but there, uh, other folks said other things. So, And uh, my granddaddy, my granddaddy and John Cook were in business together, and Papa came to West Green in 36 to run the John Cook turpentine business and later had it itself. This is when West Green's land was a dollar an acre. So that was a long time ago. The cemeteries, there are... Six cemeteries in West Green. I'm sorry, I keep my back to you, Linda. Sorry about that. Burkett Baptist Church, the oldest grave is 1843. Wilcox Cemetery is 1860. Wood Spell, which nobody can find. It's between L.F. Kirkland's house and the Winter's place out there in the woods. But it was all wood. Wooden crosses, wooden things. And there's, unless you get a somebody, archaeologists, get Dwight out there to do it. And Ward Cemetery in 1899. Old Bethel Cemetery, the first ones buried there were Daniel and Elisha Lott. But there's a Henson gentleman that's buried there. His wife was not liked by her mother and father-in-law. So when Mr. Henson died, the family ordered a marble statue from Italy, the cost of $7,000, the exact amount of life insurance and holdings the boy had. They did this so she got nothing. Another interesting story from that cemetery is there was a Mr. Vereen that owned land in West Green, actually where I grew up, and um, he had a turpentine still back there at the pond behind Mom and Daddy's house. But when he was here in the 1890s, he had a three-year-old daughter who was riding a horse and broke her neck. And she's buried in that cemetery. And within 30 days, the Vereens had sold their property and moved back north. And I always felt bad because that little girl's left there all by herself, you know. Um, any questions so far? I'm going to get to the dirty part now. <laughs> uh, when we were doing these interviews, people would say, you're not going to print this, are you? I said, well... I, 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 I can. <laughs> um, but what we did was interview families. And what was so amazing was, after it was over, somebody said, well, you didn't ask me. Yes, we did. And I, when I, the people from Nichols said, well, we don't know anything except what's in Ward's history. And to me, that's one of the saddest commentaries we have about our communities. Nobody takes that time to go back and search and look and interview. And we did it when, when we started the interviews. We had several older people still alive, like Daddy and uh, Wesley Davis, Janie Justice, James Moore. All these people that were just one generation removed from the founders were there to talk about what it was like. And see, that made it all possible. But the biggest person in West Green history, and everybody talks about him, but nobody is kin to him, I'm telling you right now, was Wash Lott. Wash was the kind of man that when he came to town, everybody else hid. He was not a kind person. He liked money and he liked power. Like in the old West days when there's one man that runs the whole town, that was Wash. It was his way or no way. He had several children. Warren was his oldest. And they were in business together quite a bit. Um, Wash got on up in age and he started having some problems. So... He went voluntarily to a sanitarium. He left voluntarily from that sanitarium. A few months later, Warren and his wife, Mary, loaded him back up and took him back. He was having violent tendencies. Go figure. 
he got out of the sanitarium from the second visit and he got to thinking about Warren was trying to take his money and his business. It was all Warren's fault. The children were trying to put him away so they could have everything. And the more he thought about it, the matter he got. And this is documented in the Douglas Enterprise. There's page after page after page, even the trial. But before he left the second time, he loaned Warren some money. And he asked Warren to pay him back. And Warren said he'd give him a 1% interest in his new sawmill. Well, he agreed. By the time he got home and hit the bottle, it didn't sound like such a great idea anymore. So later on that evening, about dark, he went to downtown West Green. There's a bar and there's a depot. And so you know where everybody was gathered. All the stores at that time were along the railroad track, just like in every other community. Well, Wash came with a pistol and he hollered for Warren. And he was in a group of a bunch of men standing there. And his brother Silas, Warren's brother Silas, was with him. He started running and hiding because he knew his daddy. Wash shot him four times, the last two times while he was laying on the ground, once in the gut and once in the foot. He washed, announced to the crowd he was going home now to kill his wife. And Wash lived, it's not even a mile from the depot. I mean, I used to walk that road all the time out there where Grand Abbey Parks used to live. Used to walk that road all the time. But he got on his horse, he went home, and he told his wife to get him a clean shirt. It was bloody all over. While he was putting on his shirt, she ran. Wash got on his horse, went to Nichols to stay, see his sister and brother-in-law, and told his brother-in-law what he had done. And his brother-in-law said, you can sleep in the barn. And while he was in the barn, he called the sheriff. The sheriff finally talked Wash when he got there two hours later to give himself in, turn himself in. So he, the sheriff brought him to Douglas. His son, let me get, I want to get this exactly right because they quoted word for word in Coffee County in the Enterprise. So hold on. It's in the back. Y'all just hang with me just one second. Warren had died an hour before they brought Wash into town. He brought, they brought him to his sister's house, Elisha Lott's house in Douglas. That's where the funeral was held. The Elks Lodge did it and they buried him and all this to do. But when they told Wash that Warren had died, and I'm going to bleep out some things, GD him, I am glad of it. This is what he said about murdering his son. <laughs> they buried him on Thanksgiving Day. Wash was, went to trial in February of that year. His plea was emotional insanity and self-defense. Unarmed man. Okay? I'm just enthused by this man. If I could go back in time, I'd want to see him. Because my, my granddaddy had an uncle that sounded a lot like John Wash Lott. I think there was one in everybody's family. But uh, he gave details of his life story, how he had helped everybody and he would raised his children. Wash was just a scion of the neighborhood. Everybody, he was just a wonderful human being. This is all at the court trial. He asked the jury for permission to pray for the forgiveness of his children and knelt down and said the Lord's Prayer and broke down and started crying. His widow was sworn in as a witness and she fainted on the stand. They deliberated one hour and 35 minutes. He was found guilty and life imprisonment was suggested. He tried to get acquittals a couple of times, but it didn't wash. He even got Judge Quincy. He tried to get Judge Quincy to talk him into helping him out some, you know, because he, he's such a good man. 
1920, at age 70, he was held in the state penitentiary at Baldwin, Georgia. On December the 7th, 1920, Wash was re received a pardon from the governor, who happened to be a friend of the family and a relative. So Wash was released to come home. And in the Douglas Enterprise, it states, we hope he's learned to rely on Jesus. <laughs> He died in 1925 after several months of pain caused by cancer. The funeral was in West Green by the Meth at the Methodist Church. Now, what's almost as interesting is what happened to his children. Warren, after he was killed, his wife and children moved to Duval County, Florida. She wasn't working, but she was renting a house. And in 1928, it shows them living in Buckhead in Atlanta. They had two children, Arwen and Juan L. That would have killed me to start with. Uh, but she still was not, showed it, no income. So obviously, she got his property and money. Had to it. Gaines was his son, and he lived in West Green, had one, and he farmed for a long time, and he finally moved to um, Virginia, then he moved to Savannah and opened a restaurant, and then in two years after the restaurant, he was doing odd jobs in Savannah, so he didn't do so well. Silas married a dean, they stayed in West Green, and they lived there the rest of their life. Jesse married a mixed lady, and they lived in Ward Street, and they had two children, and some of you are going to remember these names, were Gerald and Arl Lott. Gerald had a house on Gaskin Avenue. Mary Jane, their daughter, married Lisha Vickers, that's the one that lived in town where the funeral was. Um, Lucy married Lewis Vickers, and they had three children. Orville, Opal, and Jack. So the names keep continuing and, and growing, but West Green has ups and downs like any little community. We still have a lot of old homes. Some of them have burned or been destroyed. This, the United States is the one country in the world where we tear things down. We don't try to save them. We just try to get rid of everything that's old. Um, anybody got any questions? I probably talked way too long, but... Anybody got any questions? The other day, Carol, I ran across an old map that shows the ranch down south of Willacoochee mm -hmm. in the 1880s. How about that? So apparently it was a right. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you this. In the 1920s, the state of Georgia decided they needed more secondary education, bigger, better, stronger. West Green had the first high school in rural Coffee County in 1925. Broxton, Nichols, and you no, know, Ambrose, Nichols, and then Broxton followed right after that. But they built a school, they built it, and it burned down, then they built it back. And in 1948, they made bricks to do the gym, and they just recently tore that down. Um, but used to, in 1922, Coffee County was very proud of the fact that nowhere in the county was a child further than three miles from a school. At one time, the West Green area had like nine schools. So, I mean, it's just, it's amazing how things change, but how sometimes the personalities remain the same. They weren't getting money from the state, were they? No, they had to do a local bond issue. They, they had to do their own school system, their own bonds. And the building, co the first high, the building cost $22,000. And it was 11 classrooms. They had home ec and all this other, well, no, uh, domestic classes, home ec. So, now it's something else, but it's, that's what it was. I don't think West Green was ever bigger than Douglas. Now, uh, what I find interesting is that none of the, like Ambrose and Nichols and Broxton and West Green, they were all at one time or other about the same size. But it seems like the difference was the railroad. That was the difference because West Gr Nichols had one that went this way and then Broxton had the tram 
you know, and, but once the sawmill and the businesses leave, what are you, Nichols is the same way. They had a big lumber company in Nichols, and that's what built them up. But once it left, it kind of went down, down, down. Where did you learn about Shepard? Well, uh, I learned from Shepard by Mr. Lice Lott. He's got all kinds of information from his granddaddy and his daddy and all this. Shepard was on the cross, out on Cross Road in Huffer, Georgia. And it was a church and a school. And that's where his daddy and his granddaddy went to school. But last lot, bless his heart, he told me one time when I interviewed him, he said, we were a bunch of boys playing at ball at the depot in West Green, and Ty Cobb got off the train and played with us. And I thought, oh, all right, yeah, I'm sure he did. Lo and behold, the very date and month that he told me, it is in the Douglas Enterprise. So don't ever doubt last lot when he tells you something. Did he put it in the Enterprise? No, no, because he was just a child. He was just a child. So. You know, uh, you said the original owner of Newton. Yeah, Newton's. Uh, what was the name? Hold on. I've got it here somewhere. I may have to tell you later because I can't remember right now. I didn't write it down. It's in it's in the book. I'll let you know. Let's see. Yeah. Newton's. Now this was before Joe. James and Edward Newton. James and Edward. Edward was the daddy. James was the son. You can find all kind of interesting thing when you start looking back at old land records and who lived there and what and all that kind of stuff and you realize that <clears throat> we always heard you're six steps away from being kin to anybody and that's pretty much true if you were here in the beginning at Coffee County because those lot men, they'd do 26 youngins a piece, wasn't nothing to them. <laughs> so I mean sooner or later you're kin to somebody. So if you came in later, you wasn't as bad. What time, when did y'all come? My, the Lord's came, I don't know when, in the, about the 1800s. So she was one of the first white people. Yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, up, up here, here, Douglas. Uh, yeah, but what about your mom and them? They my came. My mother and them came from Tennessee, and they were hired by the Garrett Lumber Company. My, father, my grandfather was a mason, and he was a, a sawyer. Mm -hmm. And that was an art then to cut timber. That's I right. The, the old honey... Church, Hunt uh, Winter's Honey House. Right. The, the Timbers of that church was cut by my grandfather, plus Boyd Winter's store across the street. Right. Cut from it. Plus my uncle's house, the little little house there. there. That was cut by, by them. And uh, that, you know, that was their thing. And uh, the, the statue in, in Bethel Cemetery is my grandmother's brother. I see. Brother. Well, it, it all comes around. Yeah. Well, my parents moved back to West Spring. I was born in Savannah. When my parents moved back to West Spring. I said, no, go I don't know anybody around here. I come to find out later in life, I'm getting everybody around here. There, yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> there you are. It's, that's true. That's true. And, and so it, I told uh, Mr. Higgs one time, I did an interview on the radio, West Green is like all these other little communities where it says it takes a village to raise a child, and that's the way West Green was. You may not be blood kin, but it was still Aunt Ruby and Uncle Tubby, and it was still Aunt Lila. It was, you know, it was, and everybody got a chance to beat my butt. You know, Mama didn't fuss at them if they did. Uh, another thing, Carol, you mentioned the church of West Green Baptist. Mm -hmm. Well, on the other the north of it, in the block. Where's the Methodist Church? I did when they yeah. were built. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember who donated land and the money to build the church. And I'll tell you a little secret. That church sat on Jess Corson's land for one foot. And the reason they built a new church across the road, they either had to move it, burn it, but they had to get it off his land. So they went across the road and built the other one. When they were built, they were identical. Yep. And, and Daddy said when they came to West Green, the Methodist church 
you know how populations of churches go. They didn't have very many people and there was a hole in the roof and the first thing Papa did was get the roof fixed on that church. Well, when I was a kid, you had to visit with that church. Mm -hmm. You had to. That Sunday would go to the church. That's right. Well, church, that's right. Well, we had even when I was growing up, first and third, second and fourth. You you went to one church or the other, and we had a clubhouse that Grandmama paid fifteen dollars for. And if you, anybody had a shower or anything like that, you had it at the clubhouse, the Farm Bureau, the Home Demonstration Club. Everything met at the clubhouse. That's why I say the worst thing for small communities is for churches to build a social hall because you segregate yourself. That's just my little soapbox. But I've seen it happen so many times. The community, once the, the big high school and the ball games and all move, then all you've got is that little social group, and when you scatter it out, it's gone too. How blessed our generation is that we were raised on time we could roam around. And, Amen. And you're scared to let children or grandchildren do that. Not even this far away from you in a store. I never worried about my girls. Back in the West Street community. I knew Aunt Kate Ward and Aunt Clark South, and everywhere they went, there was somebody that lived on that street. They were not related to me, but I knew that if my children did wrong, they corrected me, and then they'd come tell me about it. Oh, yeah, even when I was a teenager, before I could get home from Douglas, Mama knew. <laughs> There were no lawyers in West Green. See? We had a bar, but we had no lawyers. We didn't even have police. We had mothers. So. Lawyers. That's right. We took him at his word. Anybody got any questions or comments? One thing that I found interesting, I married into the family in the late I won't say exactly when, but you know I'm old. Uh, the first time I ever shopped at Way and went to Shriver's shoe store and caught a pair of shoes, and the lady asked me where I was from, and I told her, and she said, Oh, that's where my granddaddy started this store. Yeah. And my mouth dropped over. They moved from West Green to Nichols to Waycross. Yeah. And Denton's Pharmacy in Yeah, Ellie, uh, LL Denton. Denton. It was in West Green before it was in Brock's. A lot of stuff. It's all gone now. It's all weeds and Brock memories. All around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad y'all came. Next, next month we're doing Ambrose. <laughs> Everything you did didn't want to know about Ambrose. Next month we're doing Ambrose. Everything you did didn't want to know about Ambrose. Thank y'all for coming.